Marcus Gill's prosperity teachings have impacted people from all over the world. Known for his dynamic teachings on success and prosperity, Pastor Marcus's influence extends through radio, television, and social media, where he reaches a global audience of close to 3 million. His life is one of significant impact, characterized by a relentless pursuit to spread the Christian faith to every corner of the earth. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Matter of fact, when I say praise the Lord, you shout hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to say it one more time. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me ask you a question. How many of you know without a doubt God's been good to you all year long? Come on, really, really, really. You can wave your hand at me and say, my year hasn't been perfect so far, but God's surely been good to me. Well, just look at somebody in your road. Matter of fact, let's have a quick competition. I want you to look at the road behind you. Look at the road in front of you. Now look at somebody on your road and tell them, say, this is the favor road. I see a whole lot of favor in the house. Matter of fact, it ain't no competition. I think I'm in a house full of people that got the favor of God today. Amen. Come on, where you at? Wave your hand at me. So the Lord is so good. Let's pray real quick before I get into today's message. Father, we thank you and we praise you. Hallelujah. For this another opportunity to minister to these your precious people. Thank you, Lord, for this house, Christian Cultural Center. Thank you for the man of God, the visionary of this house, Dr. A.R. Bernard, Pastor Jamal Bernard, the lovely wives, and all the leaders of this fine church and all the members of this fine congregation. I thank you, Lord God, that even at this moment, you're breathing on us. You're holding us in your right hand, and you've made us arrows in this season that no weapon formed against us shall ever be able to prosper. But yes, you've made us the weapon that prospers against every weapon of the enemy. Thank you for this weapon called the Word. I believe that as we release it today, somebody's going to be blessed. Somebody's going to be healed. Somebody's going to be delivered and set free. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. So, Lord, open every ear to hear, every mind to understand, and every heart to receive your word. And let us leave this place better than the way we came. It's in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And we all shout it out loud together. Amen. 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 Come on, one more time. Clap your hands to Jesus, everybody. How many of y'all in the room glad to be saved? If you see me excited all the time, it doesn't mean my life is perfect, but it means I'm glad that I'm in the hands of the Lord. Yeah. I was uh, taking a workout, a jog a few days ago, and um, I don't know how many of y'all real deep and spiritual that when you're doing stuff outside of church, God still be talking to you. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not alone in here. I'm not like the Lord. He speaks to you in the grocery store sometimes. He speaks to you on the train. He speaks to you randomly. So I was, I was taking a jog a few days ago, and... Uh, I know it was the Lord that spoke to me because I had some things on my mind. God has a special way of encouraging us just at random moments. You know, you can just be doing anything. And when you're in the will of God and as a child of God who spends time with God, uh, your experience with the Father isn't limited to the four walls of a church building. But he'll be with you everywhere you go. And so I was taking this run and uh, had some things on my mind. And the Lord spoke to me and gave me a very special word that I want to share with you today. And I want you to write this down. He said, Marcus, I'm always going to give favor to the faithful. But it got a little bit deeper. He said, I'm always going to reward the remnant. I'm always going to reward the remnant. The faithful and the remnant work interchangeably because the remnant... That's those of us who are a small group that's a part of a very large group. Makes me sometimes think about the book of Acts and even the day of Pentecost. There were 120 there that were in that meeting, but if you read the word, there were 500 who were invited. So 380 people didn't show up to the meeting, yet the Bible says that they were all on one accord and in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty man and filled all of those who were sitting. Had there been one person in that room that was off, we would never have this story because it required unity. 380 didn't come. Now, some folks would want to kill the 380 for not being a part of that moment. But in my mind, I don't see the 380 as a group 
who doesn't love the Lord or a group that doesn't want to be a part of the kingdom of God. I see the 380 as ones that would say, you know what, I'm willing to be a part of this. But then there were 120 who want to advance it. 380 know that Jesus existed at some point, but the 120 know that Jesus is alive. 380 don't mind hearing a good message and hearing a good word and reading the Bible, but then there's 120, the remnant, who don't just want to hear the word and shout over the word, but I believe there's a few of us that want to hear it and then become it. So that when people see us, whether we open our mouth and talk about the Lord or speak in tongues or wear a t-shirt with a big old, you know, letters that say, I love Jesus. You don't even have to do none of that. When you've decided to hear the word and then become the word, people will see your life and know there's something different about you. In fact, some folks that don't know no better, they say, you must be one of them Jesus people. Why does that happen? Because you're literally living the word. You don't have to have a big time title or have some hat on that tells everybody who you are in your church and what your position is. Forget about the titles. Just live it and let people see the character of Christ in your life. That is the responsibility of the remnant. How, remnant. how many people in the room can say, I'm a part of the remnant today? Like, you know, yeah, I don't just want to be a part of the church. I don't just want to say I go to CCC. That's good. That's a start. But I believe God is challenging us to say, I'm a part of the church, but I'm also an advancer of the church. I'm a, I'm a grower of the church. I want God to use me to help add to the body. If I'm talking to you, say amen. amen. And so God said to me, I'm going to always favor the faithful. And let me speak this word over somebody in the room right now that's believing God for a miracle in this moment. I know it's in the house. You look real good. But each and every one of you in this room got something that you believe in God for in this season. Let me encourage you. If you stay faithful, God's going to pour more favor on you. If you remain consistent, God's going to show up for you as a reward of your faithfulness. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think, all according to the power that worketh in us. Some people think that that's just skill. But the power, the dunamis that works in us is our faithfulness. And the ability that we have to trust God even when we don't understand what he's doing. How many of you in the room can wave your hand right now and say, I believe God's going to take care of me. He's going to take care of me. He's going to take care of my family. He's going to take care of my health. He's going to take care of my finances. Everything that's on my mind, I'm going to be just like Paul. Even if God don't do it the way I want him to do it, his grace is enough for me. His grace is sufficient for me. And since I believe that, I'm going to maintain an attitude of praise. I'm going to maintain an attitude of thanksgiving because I expect God to be faithful as I've been faithful to him. If you believe that, say amen. amen. So now, as we remain faithful in this season, there's some, there's some priorities we've got to keep in mind, some things we've got to keep in mind, some things we've got to keep in order. And I want you to write these down as a reminder and as an encouragement to help you stay on track. Oh man, the enemy loves to throw folks like us off track. He does have a job, you know. And one of the greatest ways to know that you're on the right track in life is to notice how often things are coming to get you off track. Folks that's already off track, they don't need to be taken off track. They good already. That's why some folks you look at and you say, it seems like they ain't got no problems and they ain't serving God. Well, the enemy only picks on those of us who are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And I want to encourage somebody right now that feels a little bit burdensome halfway through this year. You're only dealing with certain things for two reasons. The enemy don't like you, and God is preparing you for something great. So I want you to stay on track. Everybody say, stay on track. Matter of fact, look at your neighbor who looks blessed. All right, wait, 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 wait. Don't change. Don't change people. Because when I said blessed, you kind of, oh, wait, let me find somebody else. That was offensive. Let's try this again. Look at your neighbor and say, stay on track. Stay on track. So number one, <laughs> we got to prioritize some things. Priorities, priorities, priorities. The things that should be most important to the remnant. Things that should be most important to the faithful. Number one, make sure you prioritize your relationship with God. That's number one always. And that don't just mean just coming to church. That means make sure that God is involved in all of the affairs in your life. All of the affairs. Have, have the Lord at the center of everything you do. Prioritize your relationship with God. 
Make sure he's involved in your business. Make sure he's involved in your dealings in the marketplace. Make sure he's involved, well, let, let me go back, first of all, in your family, in your house. Uh, don't save devotion for Sunday. Have times of devotion in your home. Have personal times of devotion even in the workplace and in the marketplace. One thing that I've learned is that even when some of our business partners fail us, Jesus is the best business partner we could ever have. I'm giving that one to an entrepreneur in the room for free. That was for free. An entrepreneur in the room that's been believing for next level, and you can't find nobody to partner with and trust, when you prioritize your relationship with God, and you make sure that he's at the forefront of even your entrepreneurship, he'll be the greatest business partner you could ever have in the world. So make sure we prioritize our relationship with God. Now, how do we do that? We also prioritize praise and worship. Praise and worship was awesome in here today, wasn't it? Powerful. You felt the presence of God? Well, here's some good news. Praise and worship doesn't stop with the worship team on Sunday. But you can develop a lifestyle of praise and worship. It's a life that we live. It's not just a song, but it's how we live on a regular basis. Uh, don't let TikTok and Instagram be the first thing you peek at early in the morning when you get up. But may the first thing you do when you open your eyes is say, thank you, Lord, for another day. Father, I magnify you. I exalt you. I can't start my day without you. I can't finish my day without you. Without you, I can't even have a great day. So, Father, I set the tone in my life right now before I get up out this bed and brush my teeth just telling you, thank you. You begin your day with praise and worship and gratitude, and you know what happens when you do that? You set the tone for the rest of your day. So even if you was getting ready to have a bad day, your praise and worship just served as a weapon to change that thing. If you got up having an attitude about what you got to do on Monday, praise and worship will take your complaining and turn it into thanksgiving. So praise and worship must be a priority in our lives, not just in the four walls of the church, but you can be sitting in your office thanking God. You ain't got to be loud. Don't get fired now. You've been there told somebody, Pastor Bernard has somebody coming in and tell us to praise and worship at work and I lost my job because I got up clapping and shouting and jerking and bucking and they told me to go home. But you can be whispering a praise in your secret place. Don't nobody even got to know. You have in church. Well, everybody, there's chaos all in the office. You have in church all by yourself. My God, how great thou art. How great, how great you are. They say, what you say? Nothing. I'm talking to God. Mind your business one more. I'm just in worship because praise and worship is a part of my lifestyle. So we prioritize our relationship with God. We prioritize what? Praise and worship. How about this? We prioritize witnessing. The more you witness and talk to others about what the Lord has done for you, that helps you to maintain even the joy of your relationship with the Father. Be intentional about witnessing. Be intentional about soul winning. We still say that word soul winning, right? That's not like old school church word, but no, soul winning is necessary. As often as you can, tell others about Jesus. Spread the word about what God has done for you. And let them know what's happening at home, at your church. And invite them. Bring them in. Be responsible for adding to the kingdom. What did I tell you before? The remnant doesn't just want to say, I'm a part of the church. The remnant wants to advance the church. And Jesus said, go ye into all the world. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Your nation is where you work. Your nation is the beauty shop you go to. Your nation, brothers, is the barbershop. Anywhere where people know your name, that's your nation. That's your campus to win souls. So make witnessing a priority. Matter of fact, let's go back. Your house is your most important campus. Many of us have family members and friends, close loved ones that don't even know the Lord. Make witnessing a priority, and God will smile on you. If you believe it, say amen. amen. How about this? Make Bible study a priority. You want to really stay on track, stay in this word. All of these opportunities to gather for Bible studies, both in person and even online, these are opportunities for growth. These are opportunities to advance and to excel, to develop in our knowledge of the word so that we don't just hear it, but what? We become it. That word in the Greek is the word gnosko. Can y'all say that with me? Gnosko. Say it one more time. Gnosko. Say it like you're from over there. Kind of put a little <laughs> somewhere in there. <laughs> say it again. Gnosko. Yeah, that word gnosko in the Greek means to not just hear the word, but to build a spiritual relationship with the word. To where you're not just a hearer, that's where it starts because faith cometh by 
right? So that's where it starts. But we hear and then we become. Meditating on the word means to plot upon the word, not just to memorize it, but to become it. All right? So Bible study is necessary. It's necessary that we make Bible study a priority, both in church, in the four walls, but even personal times of Bible study. Whenever you hear a message on Sunday, go back online or get the materials, take your notes, open them up on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, review them, and then one of the best ways to witness is on your lunch breaks or different family gatherings, pull the notes out from Sunday. Find a moment in there when it's, when it might, you know, the moments where everybody just be sitting and trying to find something to talk about. So y'all, man, let me tell y'all something. Sunday, Doc taught us. And you go line upon line, and that encourages you to stay in the Word, but it also opens the door for you to witness and minister to others. If you want to do that, say amen. amen. All right? So, your relationship with God, praise and worship, witnessing, Bible study. How about this one? Make giving a priority. Make sure giving is a priority in your life. I heard a great writer years ago say, I don't give to live, but I live to give. And I've also discovered this, that one of the best ways to be like God is to be a giver. For after all, for God so loved the world that he... We wouldn't have the life we live today if God hadn't given, if God hadn't shared his best with us. And every time you give, believe me when I tell you this, God does bless you in return. There's always going to be a great harvest connected to the seed you sow. Especially when you're determined to be a sower into the kingdom and a giver to help advance the kingdom of God. When you give, God blesses your house first. And as a result of your faithfulness, he blesses his house. And here's a, here's a way that I like to visualize this thing, just if you want to have some fun with me for a moment. Whenever we take what's in our hand and place it in God's hand, he then takes what's in his house and puts it in your house. So there's always going to be a great harvest connected to your seed. When you give, God absolutely, as he promised in the word, he opens the windows of heaven, he pours out a blessing for you that you won't have room enough to receive. And you don't always know how that harvest is going to come, but believe me when I tell you, the harvest is going to meet you right at the point of your need. Sometimes you don't need more money in return. Sometimes your seed is going to bring you healing. Sometimes your seed is going to bring you some clarity. Sometimes your seed is going to get rid of certain people that's in your... Never mind, let me just... For some reason, why did they move them to another department? Oh, that's that seed I sowed Sunday. Thank you, God. So say this out loud. Say, giving, giving. In, the in the kingdom is my priority. Is my priority. Amen? Amen? And then, of course, we want to prioritize Fellowship. Fellowship. Fellowship is a priority. The word koinonia, the connecting and the fellowship of the saints. Oh, it's beautiful every time I come to CCC. And I see so many of you, many of you from all around the world that are here in New York that believe the same thing, that are hungry for the same thing. Y'all don't stay separate. It's obvious you love getting together, coming together for worship, coming together to hear a message, and coming together to be taught. That's a blessing. It's synergism. You can do it by yourself for a while, but after a while, you need somebody to connect with in faith so that you can get some things done while you're here on earth. One can chase a thousand, right? But then what? Two can put 10,000 to flight. The Bible tells us in Psalm 133 how good it is when brethren, and my grandfather would say the scripture, he'd say, and sistering. How good it is when brethren and sistering dwell together in what? Unity. The Bible there tells us it would be like oil flowing down the face of Aaron, flowing down his beard, down his robe, down his collar. He said, and there he commands the blessing. So that's almost like when we fellowship and we, be, we, we remain unified, both Brooklyn and uh, Orlando and Long Island and online, and for my sake, we're just going to call Myrtle Beach Campus my house. <laughs> when we remain unified, God releases oil that he already released on your leader. But the prerequisite for that oil being released on the house is that the body be unified. The body be on one accord. You can't have nobody on your team that doesn't agree with the flow of the vision. When there are no enemies on the inside of your circle, enemies on the outside will never have power 
to destroy what's going on on the inside. So this is why we've got to be very careful and intentional about fellowship so that we remain on the same page that what your man and woman of God are presenting to the house. You say, Pastor, I'm with you, and we're all with you. No, no, you don't be saying, oh, they ain't do that at my grandmama church back in the day. No, you ain't at your grandmama church, though. <laughs> I've never gotten on a plane and tried to tell the pilot what to do. And let alone, I've never gotten on a plane and hoped that the pilot didn't know what he was doing so I can tell him what to do. <laughs> Leadership plus fellowship equals great fellowship. And the only time it doesn't work is when leaders don't know their leaders and followers don't know their followers. But when you have leaders who are confident in who they are, which you have here, and you have followers who remain confident and proud to be a follower and not try to be leaders, then it creates great harmony. And that's when the Bible there says in Psalm 133 that the oil flows from that leader, from Aaron, from Dr. Bernard, Pastor Jamal, and then it flows down to the people. And I want to declare this over your life right now, that as the oil for favor rests in your church, that same oil, it follows you home every single week. It rests in this church, and therefore it rests in this house. And when it rests in your house, it then follows you wherever you go. If you believe that, say amen. Matter of fact, I dare to give God praise right now for the level of favor. My God, the level of favor that's in your house, that's on your leader. And how that favor doesn't stop here, but it follows you home. But let me see, the most important one I want to give you out of them all, as we stay on track and as we remain faithful. How many of y'all say, I received that word that God's going to favor the faithful? All right. And you say, Pastor Marcus, I'm one of the faithful. Let me see your hand. I just want to see. All right. All right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you can say, I'm a part of this remnant. We must prioritize prayer. Prayer is a priority. I bet you never heard nobody preach that long and then give the title. Here's the title. When we pray, anything can happen. Prayer is how we fellowship with God. Prayer is our communion with God. I heard doctor say some years ago, prayer is the elevation of the soul. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is necessary. The Bible says that men ought to always pray. My grandmother taught me years ago. She said, Marcus, you got to learn that prayer is not just how you communicate with God, but prayer is also how God communicates with us. We love to pray. We love to get on our knees and roll on the floor and just tell God everything we need and everything we want. And he loves to hear that. He's not intimidated by our requests. Believe me. And he's not intimidated by our fears. He loves it when we talk to him because that's a sign of our faith. There, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter number three, verse five and six, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all of thy ways, acknowledge yourself, acknowledge your cousin, acknowledge political leaders. No, he says, acknowledge who? Him. And what's he going to do? He'll direct your path. Oh, when we talk to God, it thrills him, I believe. He says, my son, trust me. My daughter, trust me. But we can't get too caught up in giving God our long wish list. Because in prayer, it's appropriate for us to be quiet, to hush, so that God can then minister back to us. There's so many benefits that come when we take our times of prayer. And write this scripture down real quick. I want to give you this scripture real quick just to write down real fast. I'll read it to you. I've been throwing scriptures out. Anyway, but 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verses 16, all right? It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse number 16, it says, rejoice always. Say that out loud with me. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. That's through the good, through the bad, through the dark times, through the light times. Even David said it in Psalm 34, I'll bless the Lord at what? All times. One thing that I've learned in life as believers, we've got to learn how to praise God even when things are bad. Because we know that even if it looks bad now, God is still good. So my praise doesn't stop just because I got a need. I don't just rejoice for what he's already done, but I've learned how to praise God in advance for some things that are getting ready to happen. Many of you in the room right now, and you're waiting to praise. You're waiting for the new house. You're waiting for the new door to open. You're waiting to get married. You're waiting for this, that, and the other. I day to learn how to rejoice always. Like rejoice before you receive what you've been waiting on. And watch how your praise motivates you to believe God the way. It increases your expectation. Rejoice always. 
And then verse number 17, 17 says, then what? Pray without ceasing. And in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you believe the word, say amen. amen. So there's a few benefits that come when we pray. Y'all ready for them? Just say, I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, write this down. Number one, when we pray, prayer charges our spirit. Prayer charges our spirit. Oh boy, some of you have experienced this before. You believe in God for A, B, and C, and you get a little down and discouraged because it seems like certain things aren't happening and it's not happening fast enough for you. But there's something special happens when you get in prayer about it. Because in prayer, while you're talking to God and you're speaking to the Lord and you're letting the Lord know that you trust him for this, that, and the other, and then you do what? You sit back and let God minister to you in a special way. You get up from that time of prayer feeling better than what you felt before you started praying. Anybody ever experienced that? Yeah, you, you get up saying, all right, God, I trust you. It's going to be all right. It charges your spirit, even like a phone charger. After a while, the battery go dry, but you got to stay charged up. So some of you that don't consistently pray, I'm encouraging you, find more times to beg. Pray. Make prayer a lifestyle and not just a moment when you have free time. Oh yeah, I pray when I'm taking a job. Well, that's good, but don't make that your prayer life. Be intentional about setting time aside so that God can charge your spirit up. Number two, prayer makes you tolerant of limitations. Prayer makes you tolerant of limitations. I love to say it, kind of hate to say it, but I love to say it. But folks that don't have a prayer life can't take limits. Limits cause them to lose their mind. Limits make them crazy because a limit is basically saying, you're not going to get your way right now. Limits and restrictions are uncomfortable. But men and women of God, like all of us in the room who maintain a strong prayer life, we're okay with limits. We don't get discouraged so soon when something doesn't go our way. Or when we pray and God answers us, because you know he always answers you by saying yes, no, and wait. And somebody said, well, I ain't heard him say yes, no, or wait. Well, if he's quiet, that means wait. <laughs> so it makes us tolerant of limitations. We don't lose our faith because we got a limit or because God didn't do what we wanted him to do. We say, Lord, thank you that your perfect will is being done, your grace is sufficient, and it's all good. Why can I say that? Because I spent enough time with God to know that he got it, and I've seen him work a miracle in my life before, and if it ain't working out the way I wanted to work out now, if he did it before for me, I know he's going to show up again. So I can still praise God even when I got some restrictions. Understanding that a limit is actually him protecting me from danger I can't see by myself. All right, I'm going to leave that alone because I'm almost out of time. So prayer charges your spirit. Prayer makes you tolerant of limitations. How about this? Prayer increases your prophetic insight. God gives you the ability to see what you can't see on your own when you spend time in prayer. Because he'll show you stuff in times of prayer that you can't see talking to people all the time. He opens your eyes to let you see your future in prayer. Many of you are waiting on somebody to tell you what's next. When you got a prayer life, you go straight to God. You ain't got to call nobody's hotline. You go to the Lord, and God will give you direction. And can I tell you a quick secret sometimes how he talks to you? Sometimes the Lord will speak to you in your sleep because, because when you are awake, you're too distracted. So these dreams you've been having, you know, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? Oh, he's giving you some answers. He's giving you direction. This is how he talks back to you. So pay attention to your dreams. Keep a little notepad and a piece of paper next to your pillow. Don't use your iPhone or your Android because if you wake up, you might forget by the time your face will recognition. And, you know, it take a while sometimes. <laughs> write it down. Somebody say, write it down. Yeah. Prayer increases your spiritual mindedness. And prayer saturates you in the presence of God. That's the Shekinah glory. That's his presence that manifests in your life. That's when his presence begins to move things and do things and shift things. And sometimes you can feel chills when you by yourself talking to God. It's not because it's cold in the room. Oftentimes that's you sensing the presence of God around you. And in his presence is the fullness of joy and healing and life and peace and understanding and trust. 
In prayer, your expectation rises. Psalm 62, verse number five says, Surely my soul waited only on the Lord, for my expectation is of him. There's a great man, a great prophet in the Bible named the prophet Elijah. And in 1 Kings chapter number 18, we read about the showdown on Mount Carmel. That's a whole nother story. I'll preach on that next time I come, all right? But down uh, towards the end of the 18th chapter, you read about how Elijah prayed and asked God to send rain. Y'all know that story, right? And he said, surely I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. That means what he needed, even as he was praying for it, he had expectation that it was already done. And the Bible says that Elijah began to pray and he sent out his servant to go and look and see if it started raining yet. Servant went out there, came back. Prophet, ain't no rain, God. Did Elijah decide, well, God must not want to bless us. God must not want to answer our prayers. God must be ignoring us. No. Elijah looked at his servant and he said, servant, go look again. Servant went back and looked again. <sighs> Prophet, it still ain't no rain. He didn't give up. He didn't stop dancing and shouting. He didn't come to church and fold his arms and poke his lips out. Oh, God don't want to do nothing for me. I'm like, no. He said, servant, good God Almighty, go look again. And the Bible says after the seventh time, the servant came back to Elijah. And he said, Elijah, I don't see no rain yet, but I see a real small cloud in the distance. Let me tell you what happens when you pray. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes he says no. And sometimes he says, wait. That small cloud was just a sign from God to say, I'm not going to send it like you want it right now. But just so that you know I'm here, just, just pay attention to what I'm doing. See, many of you, oh, you can't get discouraged when it don't look like what you want it to look like right away. Just because you prayed today don't mean God going to do it all today. But what he does is he'll send you little small signs of confirmation so that you can keep on marching towards what it is he's trying to do. You, can, you might be believing for a new job position right now. And what he'll do, he'll send you some little emails for you to click on and say, I'm showing you, I'm sending it your way. It's coming, it's coming. You might not get that job, but you might go to this interview and here it comes. Or maybe you're believing God for healing in your physical body. And you went to the doctor once and they said, this is wrong with you. And you go back a few months later and they say, it ain't all gone, but it looks better. See, that's that small little cloud. That little sign or maybe you got a family member, a child, a son or daughter that you want them to come to the Lord and get saved. And you ain't came to church with you yet. But one day you walk in on them and they look at that CCC on YouTube on a random Thursday. He say, what you watching church? I just wanted to see what's going on. Oh, they didn't come yet. But that's that little small cloud. And why is that cloud there? The cloud is there as a sign. It may not be the way you want it to right now. But sooner or later, it's getting ready to rain. And the Bible says after a while, Elijah and the servant noticed that the whole cloud got dark. And suddenly, there came a heavy downpour of rain, almost like the book of Ezekiel says. In Ezekiel 34 and 26, there shall be showers of blessing. So if you've been maintaining your prayer life in this season, and it don't look like God is moving for you, just go back and look again. Go back and look again. Go back and look again. Keep on praying. Keep Keep on praising and worshiping. Keep on witnessing. Keep on fellowshipping. Keep on studying that Bible. Because after a while, CCC, here comes the rain. If you stick with Jesus. But I almost feel like preaching. Y'all be careful. I got permission from Pastor Bernard to go ahead and shout. So if I shout, don't get mad at me. But if you keep on praying, keep on fasting, and keep on speaking that word over your life, your will gets motivated. Faith without work is dead. But I believe I'm in the room right now with a whole lot of folks that are working their faith, that are standing with God, that are staying on track. I got good news for you. Trouble is real, but trouble don't last always. You get ready to get blessed, my brothers. You get ready to get blessed, my sisters. Is there anybody in the room right now that says, I'm glad I'm a part of the faithful. I'm glad I'm a part of the remnant. I know that there's a reward coming and I know that there's great favor being released in this season for me. If you believe it, shout amen somebody. Matter of fact, I'm getting ready to get out of here, but let me see what it looks like to be in a church full of people that know how to praise God in advance for the rain that's coming, for the showers of blessings. It won't be long now. I said it won't be long now. If you keep on praying, if you keep on fasting and you stand with God after a while, I said after a while, here comes the rain. Somebody say yeah. Say yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo! Come on, pop your hands 
for Jesus. Y'all got to go. I got to go. I got to go. But just high five. High five five people. Say favor, 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 favor. Favor. Woo! Favor. I'm out of here. I can't do it. I can't do it. Yes, sir.